If you are looking to buy just one computer, would you go with a Mac Pro 2013 or a Mac Mini M1? I'm always surprised how many people would choose the Mac Pro 2013. Both computers can be found on eBay for fairly similar prices. That is, assuming you're looking at a higher-end Mac Pro 2013 or the bottom-tier Mac Mini M1. I'm personally in the opinion that even in its 8GB of RAM, 256GB of storage configuration, that the Mac Mini is just the better buy for performance alone against a Mac Pro 2013 even when it's fairly maxed out. So in this video, I'm putting it to the test. This should be a interesting comparison as the Mac Pro 2013, despite its age, has some clear advantages. It has eight times as much RAM, dual dedicated GPUs, more physical CPU cores, and the ability to upgrade its storage well beyond what a Mac Mini tops out at, which is two terabytes for the non-pro version. And storage for it is a hell of a lot cheaper. Apple charges $800 for two terabytes, and you can get about eight terabytes for that price. There are some caveats with the Mac Pro 2013 as not all drives are compatible and you'll be limited to 1,500 megabytes a second. We'll come back to that in a minute. My Mac Pro 2013 is almost top of the line. It has a 12 core CPU and 64 gigabytes of RAM, but it only has the D300 GPUs instead of the higher end D500s or D700s. I got a really good deal on it for $200, but I was rolling the dice because I did not know what GPUs I'd get, as it was a bulk listing. There isn't a massive performance difference between the different GPU models, roughly about 25 to 35% speed increase between the D300 and the D700 in most tests. But the extra VRAM found in the upper models does assist in things like RAM previews and motion graphics apps, and of course, gaming. As previously mentioned, the Mac Pro 2013 has dual GPUs, but very, very few apps can make use of them. To get my Mac Pro 2013 ready for the test, I upgraded the SSD from an Apple 128GB SATA drive to an NVMe 256GB SSD. I got it for under $20. Oh, and it takes a $3 adapter. I also installed OpenCore so I could upgrade to Ventura so both machines would be running the same operating system, and thus they could also run the current versions of software like Pixelmator Pro, Logic, Motion, and Final Cut Pro. On Lend, I had the lowest end configured Mac Mini M1 with only 8GB of RAM and 256GB of storage. If you want to feel uncomfortable, Apple Silicon is about 4 years old now. This computer was released in November of 2020. What I'm trying to get at is that sense of ennui you're experiencing about the latest round of Apple Silicon Macs is because they're not that new anymore. So Ivanki, I hope I said that right, maker of high-end docks asked me if I'd like to check out their latest Thunderbolt dock, and if I liked it, would I please mention in the video. This is not a paid sponsorship, all they did was provide me with this unit to review. I'll keep this really brief. The Fusion Dock Max 1 is a dual Thunderbolt 4 dock, which I didn't even know was a thing, but apparently they are. This makes it capable of driving up to 4 displays, 3 6K displays, plus an additional 4K display, provided you have a Mac that supports this many displays at those resolutions. It also provides 96 watts of charging, has plenty of USB-C and A ports on the front and back, audio outs, and 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. Interesting they told me this was not for use with the Mac Mini, which is why I wanted to sneak this product into this video. It works great with the Mac Mini, but I suspect they just didn't want people plugging this into the Mac Mini because it can only drive two displays. I'm not making any commission here, so buy it or don't, but damn if it isn't sure fun misusing products that a company is willing to send me. To be fair, it is the nicest dock I've used, and they do make other versions that might suit your needs better. I use it for work with my M1 Max. Again, I'd like to thank them, and there will be a link in the description as well as a discount code for anyone who's looking to make a purchase. These things are pretty amazing. Anyhow, let's do some benchmarks. Before we get to the real world testing, let's start with some synthetic benchmarks. In Geekbench 6, the Mac Mini is clearly the winner in the CPU department. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. However, in the GPU department, the lowly D300 in the Mac Pro 2013 is a mixed performer. It clearly isn't up to the Mac Mini M1 in Metal, but does slightly outperform the M1 in OpenCL. Most viewers probably wanted to see the D700 against the Mac Mini M1, and I don't blame them because I would have liked to too. I pulled some benchmarks from the Geekbench website, and here's a comparison of the Mac Pro 2013's GPU configurations versus the Mac Mini. The D700 is just slightly faster than the Mac Mini M1. 
Interestingly, I noticed there's some discrepancies between the Geekbench 6 listings and my testing likely due to various factors like OS versions, tasks running in the background, etc. The main point here is to illustrate that there is not a massive difference when it comes to compute with the D300, D500, and D700. There's roughly a 25-35% to 35 range between the D300 and the D700. This will be the only time I introduce outside benchmarks in this video. Moving on to storage. Using a Morpheus disk drive, overall the Mac Mini is the winner, although the Mac Pro 2013 with the Toshiba XG6 SSD pulls out a few wins in random writes. There is a bit of irony, as the Mac Pro 2013's Xeon chipset would support PCI 3.0, but the SSD is behind the PCH. Thus the SSD is capped to PCI 2.0 speeds. Fortunately, the Mac's read and write speeds are less felt than random read and writes. I have to give the win to the Mac Pro 2013 even with its compatibility quirks and lower top speeds as the Mac Mini simply cannot be upgraded. In the memory bandwidth department, the Mac Mini is mostly faster, but if I had to guess, I would have assumed there would have been a wider performance difference. All these synthetic benchmarks are interesting, but it doesn't really give a clear answer how these computers would perform using real world tools. The first real world test I performed was with Final Cut Pro. I tested two projects in 4K, one to HD. 264 and one to ProRes. Then the Mac Pro 2013 gets clobbered in H.264 but manages to stay within spitting distance of the Mac Mini with ProRes. It is important to point out the Mac Mini M1 does not have a media engine, which accelerates ProRes. The media engine originally was found only in the Pro and above in the M1 series, since the introduction of M2 is found in every single configuration. If you're looking strictly at video editing, you might want to skip on the M1 and go for M2. As someone who's gone post Adobe, Pixelmator Pro is my image editor of choice. For these benchmarks I used three different machine learning behaviors, upscaling a 16 megapixel image using super resolution, debanding an 18 megapixel image, and then enhancing an 18 megapixel image. Even if I had a D700 in my Mac Pro 2013, I wouldn't have expected more than a 30% speed increase, which would have been still a lot slower than the Mac Mini. In Pixelmator, the Mac Mini is a runaway winner. Moving to Logic Pro X, things get interesting. And it's not because I said X instead of 10. This is where the Mac Pro 2013's hyper-threading, more core count, and more RAM come into play. Using the Logic Pro X benchmark, it's able to play back nearly twice as many tracks as the Mac Mini. I tried rerunning this test several times, and the results were always the same. According to the benchmark website, the MWOOD should be able to do about 110 tracks? My guess is these computers had 16 gigabytes of RAM instead of 8. Even then, the Mac Pro 2013 would still have a slight advantage in Logic Pro. In Apple Motion, I brought in a complex animation I made and exported it to ProRes to minimize the CPU overhead. The Mac Mini just pulls out ahead despite the dual GPUs in the 2013. Moving to web benchmarks, I used Safari 17.5 and knew this would just be a bloodbath as Apple optimized its ARM CPUs for just-in-time compiling and its JavaScript core is very much optimized for Apple Silicon. The M1 just absolutely smokes the Xeon, ranging from 3 to 12 times faster. It's important to remember that many popular applications like VS Code, Slack, Discord, and so on use Electron, thus those applications will run much more efficiently on Apple Silicon. Modern image compression is CPU intensive. Here's a test suite for WebP, Google's open standard that allows for both lossless and lossy images. Think of it as a hybrid between JPEG and PNG. The Mac Mini is able to process more megapixels a second, ranging from 50% to 100% more. The final test is a smattering of compile times due to the Fornix test suite not understanding the differences between Apple Silicon and x86 Homebrew, this was a real pain in the ass to set up. I had to manually configure symbolic links and chase down dependencies. Some tests were even more broken than that, so I went with the path of least resistance, and those are the ones you see. It'd be very boring if I explained what each test is, so instead just check the description and there'll be links to those tests. The takeaway here is if you are compiling code, the Mac Mini is the clear winner. Now there are use cases where the Mac Pro 2013 has value, like running x86 legacy software. I used the x264 encoder and the test was x86 only. The Mac Pro 2013 clearly bests the Mac Mini, so that's something to keep in mind. Don't worry, I'm not diverging for too long. I like to splash in a little bit of what goes into these videos. 
I don't think it comes across what a pain in the ass it is to get these shots for these videos. I've done a surprising amount of hiking with computers in my backpack. Gotta say, it's pretty amazing though because I'm literally by myself out here. I have to point out there's also obvious things that x86 Mac can do that Apple Silicon just cannot. Chiefly, virtualization of x86 OS's and dual booting to popular alternative operating systems. I wasn't able to find any real world tests that could stress test RAM differences in a measurable and repeatable way. To be fair, I could have run a series of benchmarks and then artificially stressed out the memory so it was capped out and had high memory pressure and then rerun those same benchmarks to see the impact on the performance, but that really wouldn't tell us much without comparing against a 16 gigabytes of RAM Mac mini, which I don't have. Anecdotally, in a non-scientific manner, I can tell you that using Final Cut Pro, Pixelmator Pro, Motion, and Sound Studio all at once was more pleasant on the Mac Mini. I can tell you from experience, there are some dev tool chains that definitely benefit from a lot more RAM, specifically using a lot of Docker containers. In fact, I decided to put this to the test by using OpenWebUI with Olama. This is just one of many ways you can run large language models on your Mac locally. Most importantly, it has a Docker configuration so you don't need to do a lot of local setup. While I might be unsure how I could actually benchmark this, you can see in real time just how much faster the Mac Pro 2013 is when it comes to generating text. This is running completely on the CPUs and not the GPUs, so it is entirely the RAM difference here. Moral of the story is that 8GB of RAM can be a big limiter in certain scenarios. This is just an outlier. That said, for the most part, a Mac Mini with even only 8GB of RAM will outperform the Mac Pro 2013 with 64GB of RAM for most operations. This is not to say that the Mac Pro 2013 is not without merit, and even in the case of Logic Pro, it's the better machine. If you're looking at a $350 Mac, the Mac Mini is the better machine for most situations, often by a considerable margin. The Mac Mini also has a few other advantages like Thunderbolt 4, better wireless with AX support, and of course, being officially supported by Apple. It's pretty clear if you need a daily driver, the Mac Mini is the computer to get. I really want to do this again, but next time comparing the Mac Pro 2013 against a Mac Mini 2018. I suspect the Intel Mac Mini would be the better computer, but not by much. I don't think I'll be doing that anytime soon since the Mac Mini 2018 sells for more on eBay than the Mac Mini M1. I don't know why. Maybe there's a niche that I just don't know about. I would like to thank my Patreons for helping make upgrades like this possible. These guys are the greatest and I can't thank you enough. 